Your country is being invaded. That is the theme of our latest Trumpet Print magazine. And the Trumpet Print is one of our most important publications. Its articles get the most work, the most research and refinement. Trumpet editor-in-chief Gerald Flurry frequently writes its biggest, most important pieces. And we print it on actual dead trees, paper, so that we can deliver it to you. You can study it, go over it in detail. So today I'm joined by Trumpet Assistant Managing Editor Philip Nice to discuss this latest October issue of the Trumpet magazine. Good to be with you. Thanks for thanks for joining me. So this theme of invasion, this is actually the second kind of cover issue that we've had about immigration this year. Can you tell us a bit about why do we go in that direction and uh, maybe what makes this a bit different from that earlier issue where we also addressed this subject? That's right. It's uh, I remember when we were in the in the meetings, we were talking about this quote from the editor in chief that that you and I will will talk a little bit more about, probably. But we uh, we tried to look for something that wasn't immigration because we had we had talked about that in, in a previous magazine in a previous issue. And we thought, you know, we just we just covered that. We just hit that pretty hard, gave the Bible prophecy perspective on mass immigration. And so in the meetings, we were looking for for some other topics that might be more important to hit, especially with the election coming up and and all kinds of things going on with with that. But this we did. We just kept coming back to this this issue and even at the risk of putting a cover similar to a previous cover making the same point that we made just a couple of issues ago uh, we just thought that it was it was so important to to hit again because of this statement by the editor-in-chief and on page 10 in this issue in this mass migration article by Josue Michels well, we talk about this quote it's from the last issue that you and I were just talking about and it's from the trumpet editor in chief Gerald Flurry and it makes the claim not only is immigration mass immigration a major major civilizational scale issue which many people are kind of late to coming to understand even that but it's an intentional strategy that's the claim that he made and it's an intentional strategy in particularly particular countries more than others so this article claims that it's the united states canada australia south africa britain these are especially targeted for mass migration and that it all traces back to really one powerful person behind the scenes that is implementing and pushing through this strategy, which in 2016 was kind of a a side issue, kind of a a down ballot issue, as they say. And now everyone's realizing there's something very serious about this mass migration issue. And some fewer are starting to think, is this actually intentional? And so that's why this rises to the to the level of having three or four features in this trumpet right after having covered it a couple issues ago. Well, if there is any story worth hitting hard over the court twice over the course of a couple of years, I mean, migration is definitely one of them. I mean, this is one of the big stories of the decade, and I think it's a story that, in some circles, haven't got the attention hasn't got the attention it deserves. I I think some people have been locked onto this, and if that's you, great. Yeah, this has been a transformational story. I think other people, there's this, especially here in the UK, like people have been talking about migration being a problem for a decade, two decades. And so people have tuned it out and haven't really realized that migration problems build on each other. Like you're adding to more and more people than those that are already there. But then also what is going on right now is massively higher than what was going on 10 years ago when we were still talking about a problem. It was still a problem 10 years ago. So like in Britain, net migration last year was 750,000 people, three quarters of a million. 
685,000 uh, people this 2023. 2022, 745,000 people. Like, this is a large city coming into the UK every year, again and again and again. You go back 10 years ago, when it was controversial, it was 200,000 people. Like, we're getting as many people, we're getting four times the number of people coming in as we were getting 10 years ago, when it genuinely was a problem. And I think with the US, the stats are less about high levels of legal migration and more about high levels of illegal migration. Uh, but these are hard to comprehend, like nation changing figures. You go to Canada and it's half a million people a year. Canada has half the population of the UK, tiny population compared to the United States, and they're importing half a million. Like the fundamental characteristics of these nations are changing like in lifetime, like this is not generational shifts. These are within a few years to the point now that London is a foreign country. It is no longer a majority British city in the way that it was just a generation ago. And that change is going on much, much more rapidly. I think the scale of this, that's actually what I've kind of written down in the margin is people like, like you said, immigration kind of you hear it a, a lot and then you're thinking okay that's an issue like the economy and you know the everything else but but you stop and realize the numbers you're talking about and the numbers here in the united states there's the known numbers in the united states i believe it's eight million over the past four years uh, almost four years and and like you're like you characterized it, an entire city moving into a, a country every every year or, or more than that here in the United States. Uh, and those are the known numbers. Then there's the unknown. And, and there's the unknown of, of foreign adversaries taking advantage of the fact that the, that the border is porous, which is a whole separate issue. But just the, the huge numbers are, are flowing in. That's going, as you said, that's going to change the character of a city. It's going to change the character of a country. And and if there were civil wars and unrest and failed governments happening to our north and to our south, or you know, if if you just live right next to a war zone and there's tons of people pouring over the border, or if you live right next to Venezuela and there's tons of people fleeing the economic disaster there, then then you would see how oh, this is an, an unfortunate, a damaging, uh, a, a serious problem that's, that we have to deal with. But that's not the case. There are, there are people who are suffering. There are people, of course, who want to, to find a better economic life. And there are many, many, many of those people. But the way this is all working, and that's what this issue opened my eyes to, is, is it's a strategy you know, we use that word intentionally. Like it is a strategy to, first of all, entice or entice or at least motivate, incentivize people to want to go through this process of, of migrating away from their country and 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 to risk uh, what it takes to to get to the United States, for example. But there's the there's that, uh, but then there's all of this, all of these details that that I was pretty surprised that as I was reading these drafts, that it's intentional, it's a system. There's tons of money going into keeping this flow going and, and, and attracting people into it and then flowing it up uh, all the way from of Central America, all the way up through Central America, through Mexico. You know, it's not just Mexican citizens coming across the border into the United States. It's, it's, it's people from all, all kinds of countries coming to Ecuador in, in, in a lot of cases uh, because of the lax immigration requirements there, and then starting the illegal migration process up to the United States. But it's, it's facilitated, it's organized, they hand out maps, <laughs> and, and it's, it's part of a strategy. So the, so the intent is to fill, especially these countries, United States, Canada, Australia, uh, Britain, with illegal immigrants. That's a strategy. There's a lot of political capital, a lot of literal capital going into the process to 
to get these people here. This isn't spillover from a war zone. This isn't just people from next door seeing, you know, I want to live there instead of here. This is a is a a massive operation that takes, as I say, political capital. It takes physical resources. It takes diplomatic cover to keep this thing going. And so that's that really does start to raise questions. Why and who is behind, you know, why is this happening and who is behind causing this to continue to happen when it's not just refugees from a war zone? So so is the goal to help the immigrants or is the goal to change the destination? And this this point about how organized it is, I found this fascinating from Andrew Miller's article, Expose the United States Invasion, where he has this section where he, he talks about this uh, documentary by uh, Mudrakers. I'd never heard of this from, from January. I want to go and watch this now, where I have got to take my hat off to this. Thomas Hicks and his brother, I guess, they're the journalists, where they went to Ecuador and hiked to the right. United States. And they did the route. And they didn't die. Uh... I mean, that's, that is, that is, that is guts. But they talked about, well, this is, I'll quote Andrew's article. They discovered secret Chinese hotels, met with UN employees, crossed the dangerous Darien, Darien Gap, were smuggled into Mexico by the Sinaloa cartel, rode the Mexican train of death, and were even kidnapped by the Gulf cartel before making it back to the United States. Uh, the gripping documentary United States Invasion Route Exposed showcases the entire illegal alien pipeline into the U.S. for what it is, a United Nations supported migration agenda masquerading as an organic humanitarian crisis. You know, there are officials from the United Nations and China and other places facilitating this migration route. But what really makes this edition of the magazine, I think, stand out from the invasion cover that we had earlier in the year is tracing back to who is behind that migration. And you made that point with that quote from Mr. Flurry. I think that guided everything that, that we did here, that it all goes back to former President Barack Obama and that he has played a massive role in opening the floodgates to migrants in the United States, but also in Britain and Canada and Australia and elsewhere. And that you know, I wrote an article for that older migration one, and I wrote about what was going on in Britain and Canada and getting trying to get across a sense of scale of what is happening here. I don't think I mentioned Barack Obama once. Uh, that was the angle that was missing. And that is what is brought in in, in Andrew's article and in, in Joshua's article. I think Andrew's focus is on the United States, and then Joshua Michels has, has his article, Mass Migration is Leading to Race Wars that focuses more on the experience of Britain and Canada and Australia, et cetera. Um, and that's the key difference this time. Right. And if Mr. Fleury hadn't said that, um, then then we would have picked a different topic, right, to write three or four features on, to write to design an infographic on. Um, but he he said that, and we knew it was important. And, and, and as in so many cases with the trumpet, you're starting with the end point and working your way backward. And I, I, I appreciated how Josue wrote his piece when he said, Mr. Flurry said this, now we're looking for the support. And and in, in any other case, right, you're just trying to look for the evidence and then make up a conclusion as best you can uh, based on that. Here, we, we are we're starting with the conclusion and and working our way backwards. And we found evidence the muckrakers documentary is a is a providential like <laughs> i think it's providential that that existed that those men were able to record the whole process and muckrakers is just a reference to to american journal investigative journalism uh a president said that it was like they're raking muck <laughs> and so the journalists kind of take that as a as a, a badge of honor. So it just means investigative journalism, but they, the fact that they could go through that whole process and, and realize there is a strategy. There are, you know, what they can characterize as hotels along the way. There's, there are maps, there are, uh, the infographic divides it down into 12 steps where the United Nations and so forth, uh, these organiz international organizations are not trying to help these people in their country that they're from. They're not trying to uh, get 
you know, stop them in, in Ecuador. They're not trying to stop them in Panama or, or Mexico and, and take care of them there. Um, there's, there's that process. You, you, like you're saying, you need somebody driving that in a, in a normal world, nations are not going to, to want people to be flowing into their country across their border or even through their borders. Um, they're not going to want the, the criminal cartels being even further enriched by trafficking human beings. We could do a whole segment on the, on the fact that this is, you know, we look back in previous ages about, oh, wow, how did the, how did the people allow such a thing to happen? How do, how are we allowing what happens to people on this route? What happens to these migrants when they're in the hands of, of drug cartel members who who are their only way to know which way to go through this forest they're completely vulnerable to them what ha what do you think happens i mean the, there's evidence all over the southern border of the united states of what's happening to women to children and and someone says it's worth it to keep this thing going to keep flowing people through half a continent well i mean you know a, a large part of the continent uh and 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 to consider what is happening to children and women and and men along the way as worth it you know worth it to do to do what well like you said back to what you're saying about this quote um well maybe that, maybe that I, I just want to pick up on before wrote. we before we do that i i thought that was a really good point and one I don't know, maybe we've not considered it all. I, I, I haven't talked about enough. Is that what we are doing right now is actively immoral, right? right. Like, like I think right. there's a lot of people that push accepting migrants as the moral, compassionate thing to do. Right. And that if you right. don't want to bring more migrants into your country, you are selfish. Like if you, in Britain, it's about boats in terms of illegal migration. They're coming in on boats over to the, in the English Channel, they're arriving in Dover and Folkestone. And it's, people see themselves as compassionate if they want them to stay and you are selfish if you say well we need to deport them which is absurd like if you look at um if you for argument's sake let's just say it is a compassionate thing to do to allow in a certain number of refugees and that we should be doing that to help help the world and for arguments to say you also say well we need to have a democ we sh democ we're a democracy the people should decide who and how many setting up a foot race that says whoever gets to set their toe on our soil gets to stay while people that don't make it to our soil don't is an insane way to to to, to allocate refugee places it's led in the uk to the insane situation where two percent of algeria's adult males have moved to britain like one in 50. uh it mean, leads to people dying in boats because the only way to get to Britain and then to Europe with people coming in from Africa or across the Mediterranean is on these small boats. And you're creating this pull factor so that many, many people die. Like, it is immoral. And it is not merely selfish. I don't think in any stretch to say, no, send people who come in illegally back. We need a legal system. We need rule of law. Like that's better for the people within America and within Britain, but it's better for the impoverished masses of the world as well. Uh, and I think that's a case that that maybe doesn't get made enough. But and also just maybe before we move on to your other point, I just also wanted to draw attention to the infographic. That infographic again is is kind of you get a lot of from Andrew's article very quickly in that how to become an illegal alien in, in twelve easy steps. Uh, so there are, that's a great part of the, the Trumpet print edition. But um, sorry, Ali, you were going to talk, you were talking about, I think, that point about what makes this issue different. Yeah, the, the infographic is, is one reason to get the Trumpet subscription. I'm sure you say it on the show uh, frequently enough, but it's completely free. And that means free, free, you know, mailing postage. You know, there's no, there's no, you know, give certain love offering or suggested donation or any of that type of thing. It's really, truly free. And then every year you just have to say, yes, I still want it. Um, so it's a, it's a free uh, professionally done magazine. And it includes 
uh, the benefit of of the infographic, as you were just saying, and the benefit of the dead trees, as you said earlier, that uh, to just sit down with something worthwhile reading and to to digest it and to consider it and to consider in this case this point that something is 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 driving this something considers it worth it for people to capsize in boats and on that i just have to jump in because our producer george has just sent me a breaking news story from almost literally right this minute where 12 people have died in the english channel from their boat capsized so I mean, this is this is real. This is happening every day. It just happened right now. Even as we're talking about this, people are dying from these from this route. People are dying. This is a real thing. This is a humanitarian crisis at the southern border in the English Channel. And and this is costing people. And like like you summed it up really well there. There's a there's a moral case here we we look back at the past so easily and say you know why did people allow the you know holocaust or this war to break out or this refugee crisis you know if we had been in the days of our fathers we would not have allowed such a thing and this is happening and and our you know future generations would look back and and say how did they do that why did they do that how did they allow that when they had freedom they had the ability to make laws in the way that generations of human beings for thousands of years have not had the power to do something about it and 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 there's kind of this feeling of oh i guess we do this now i guess we we are you know a po- post post national nation as as uh trudeau says in canada um this is a moral issue and and that's that's something you'll find in the trumpet that you don't find anywhere else like what's the moral position here what's the moral application to geopolitics you know these issues immigration being the one we're talking about right now um but uh t- 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 yeah it's, it's sad to hear um and on that point about you know people are letting this happen or or this is the way it is i think that's part of the remarkable part of this story is that actually very few people want this to be happening. You know, like the United States, I think it's very clear people don't want this crisis on the southern border. You see that even in the way that all of a sudden we're pretending that Kamala Harris was not the border czar. Because right. no, there are there's a tiny constituent of voters who are looking at an open southern border and saying, yes, I want that. And I think it's the same in Canada. Certainly in the UK, uh, you have every single party that has been elected for the last 15 years has been elected on a platform with a manifesto pledge to cut migration. Like every vote where people have the opportunity, they vote against this. I mean, you look, we just had the the news that we'll talk a lot more about on, on Friday in Germany with the alternative for Deutschland having really quite a massive victory in a couple of Eastern German states, uh, largely on the backs of a, a, a opposition to migration. Like, nobody wants this, yet it is happening. And that's where you know, it traces back to, to, to what is going on behind it is, is so critical. Right. And, and when, when so many people don't want it, when a majority do not want it, and, and they, they use the legal you know, system, the constitutional system to express that, and it's, it's still happening, um, number one that does not absolve us um, of well, our leaders are just taking over. Um, that is that is the case we're about to talk about uh, how much power is, where the power is coming from to push all this through. Uh, but secondly, we have allowed immoral leaders. We have al- we are allowing them to contravene the the will of the people. Um, uh, so so the the people do bear a responsibility here, but. Um, but it's absolutely true that something very undemocratic and very uh, powerful and very intentional is motoring this through at the cost of 12 uh, lives here and a and hundred rapes this month or whatever it might be. I don't have the stats in front of me, but they, they hang the, tr- the clothes 
on the trees in the southern border. Ranchers are down there finding rape trees. That's happening. We have not found a way to to get our leaders to stop that from happening. If the people don't want it, then it's a political risk to then push it through and try to make it palatable and try to try to make people accept it. And they've and they've succeeded in that. The elites have exceed, uh, succeeded in that. Um, and I mean, not just the elites in general, but elite immigration officials. And and the this issue it does nail it down to some some specific people. Amy Hope being one uh, part of an international organization for migration, helping power this this thing through. And Alejandro Mayorkas uh, here in the United States is 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 powering this through and more uh, more th- specifically intentionally uh uh inexorably than i thought and who do those two people who do these other people in power trace back to again mr Floyd started with the conclusion barack obama barack obama when you go through this issue you look at uh, Josue michelle's article you look at andrew miller's article um and and put it together with the infographic you realize that that this man has power and he is exerting it and at every opportunity whether it's in public speech or or whatever goes on behind the scenes that we don't know about he wants immigrants crossing borders into the united states in particular canada in particular britain in particular uh, Australia as well, at whatever cost, at, at certainly the high cost that it's certainly uh, incurring to have this constant flow of migration uh, going on. But but Josue went back and, and <laughs> he really put a ton of work into this, just like draft after draft, huge word counts that <laughs> we, you know um, that we were trying to you know boil down. Um, and again, starting from the conclusion, looking, what is the evidence? What is, is there a thread that weaves together these, these things and shows the strategy? And Barack Obama is not far from any of those nodes uh, of this strategy that keeps mass immigration going. And that's, you know, this, this kind of gets to why we talk about, I mentioned this book, America Under Attack, quite a few times on this show. I mean, this is Trumpet World. It's in the name, like a global perspective is a key part of what we're doing here with this show. And yet quite a few times we've mentioned this book, America Under Attack, and we've recommended you go and you get and you read America Under Attack. It's got America in the title. It is not just about America and it is not just necessary for understanding America. And I think this shows why there are quite a lot of people that will talk about this global push to migration. That is affect you know it's it's hitting Berlin, it's hitting Paris, it's hitting London, it's hitting what you know all of these countries, and they'll talk about globalists or or a global agenda, and I think with the light of Bible prophecy, you can be more specific than that, and it's not merely this amorphous blob. There is a specific individual that is behind so much of this, and I think absolutely he does kind of work through this globalist agenda and he does have a whole bunch of people that think like him uh, and that he maybe can cooperate with or knows what button buttons to push to kind of force to cooperate um so yeah there is kind of this globalist cadre that is pushing this but when you use bible prophecy you it reveals you know, this is the spiritual dimension behind what is happening and so you need that book to understand what is happening within europe and within Britain and within all of these other countries as well. And that spiritual dimension is that God is allowing Satan the devil, he's cast down to this earth, and he's allowing to push forward his agenda. And God is allowing it as as, as all part of his plan and all, all part of his plan of salvation. We really emphasize this, I think, on Friday's show where we try to say, you know, all of these different bits are happening according to God's plan. And that's where the, the incredible amount of hope is. But God is allowing Satan to do this. And the Bible reveals how Satan works. It says, well, we can't be ignorant of his devices. We have to understand how he works. And one of the basic patterns of how he works is using one highly placed individual 
to cast truth to the ground. And so you you understand that, and then you look at well, the Bible's focus on Israel, and the Bible's focus on the fact that that God is using the nations of Israel for a specific purpose that despite themselves and despite a lot of their sin and evil, he is using them to teach a lesson to the world about how you can be given all of these wonderful physical blessings, but you'll waste and squander them all if you reject God. Um, you, know, you understand that and then you know that the person that Satan's using is going to be at the top of Israel. It's going to be at the top of what is the current Israelite superpower, America. And so you can use that Bible prophecy to zero in on, on Barack Obama. And so th that is what America Under Attack does. And it shows you from the Bible, you're using revealed truth from the Bible, why, why we're watching this man. And I think you see that agenda behind the global migration crisis. I think you know, we focused in this article on those English speaking countries, on those Israelite countries. There is quite clearly a massive migration problem in other countries as well. And we talk about that on the show a fair bit. And France, Germany, Italy, you know, all of all of Europe. And whether or not it's Barack Obama behind that, at the end of the day, it's the same spiritual force. And Satan is using different global policies to bring about the ends that he wants. And he wants to bring down these countries that God has blessed, Israel. He wants to raise up other countries to, in order to do that. Ultimately, he's opposed to all of these countries. Uh, and so he's bringing about his agenda and migration is a major tool for that. And God is allowing that. He's ultimate, he, is in, he is the one in control and he's allowing that for us to you know, learn our lessons, to learn that we need him, that mankind cannot govern himself. Uh, and this kind of government was a key theme of the previous trumpet, trumpet print issue. Uh, but it, it, it's, it, I think it's an excellent way of showing how America Under Attack gives that revealed truth you need to understand the world, no matter where you live. It is not just a book for Americans. I think that does bring us quite neatly to Trumpet Editor-in-Chief Gerald Flurry's article. I think what we'll do is we take a quick break. We'll start a new segment and we'll look at his articles and, and zero in on his articles in, the, in this latest Trumpet print that begins with this article, all focus on right around why God gives Bible prophecy and then our role in getting that message out. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Trumpet World. I'm joined with Trumpet Assistant Managing Editor Philip Nice, and we're discussing the latest Trumpet print edition. I'd like to get into now Trumpet Editor-in-Chief Gerald Flurry's articles in this issue, beginning with his From the Editor prophesy or become God's enemy. Quite a, a, a striking title uh, and a really powerful way to kick off the magazine. Right. I, as you were talking in the last segment there about immigration and, and, and then adding the America Under Attack perspective on it, the perspective of that booklet by Mr. Flurry. Um, I, I was just thinking about this, this from the editor, because I think a lot of people, when they think of, of applying the Bible to real life, uh, they think very broadly. Uh, that's my my perspective. Is that you know you see in the Bible it says you know the the wicked shall come to naught maybe you know or some, some some phrase like that and you think well generally somehow in the end you know the wicked shall come to naught um, or prophecies in the Bible you know generally say this nation will generally rise or fall or or whatever it might be but like you were just saying. It's so much more specific than that. It's surprisingly specific. You know, I've been with the trumpet for a while, and then it, it'll surprise me how specific someone will come out. Actually, this quote from uh, about immigration was surprising to me that immigration isn't just this global issue or this big problem, or or and not only is it you know strategic, but it, you will be able to trace it back to one man. That is a very specific. Uh, a prophecy, and and you look at the the Bible, and like Mr. Floyd says in this from the editor, one third of it consists of prophecy. If you were to go through it, you know there are huge sections of where where the the Bible writer is saying this will happen in the future, and 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 staking the the authority and and the legitimacy of the Bible on that happening in the future. And and so it's it's just, just that point is is a really powerful one is how specific uh, these prophecies are and how you can 
you can't apply them. And so, so I, I like you said about this title. If you're if you're like, oh yeah, I I'm open to prophecy, <laughs> or or yes, I believe in prophecy. Well, there might be more you need to do, um, judging by this title in in um, in your in your relationship toward prophecy because it's a lot more specific and it's a lot more powerful than I think a lot of even Bible believers understand. That's a I think that's a really good point, and I think. Like when I while I was reading this article for the first time, I was I, it even popped into my mind like, oh, this would make a great foundation for a Bible study segment on Trumpet World, uh, and I might still do that at some point. Like, Mister Flurry just makes it very clear and basic even why we get into Bible prophecy, mm -hmm. because I think to a lot of people, Bible prophecy is weird, and I think there's right. a temptation maybe to tune out when you hear people mentioning it, and I get that, and I think there's a couple of reasons why. I think one is some of what you hear from Bible prophecy is weird. Like it is something that you get some wacko people talk about. And you know, it's always the Daily Express will always amplify some very weird interpretation of Bible prophecy. And everything then to do with Bible prophecy sounds weird. But I think the other reason is that churches don't talk about it. And so if you grow up going to church and, and like you just never hear about it. And so to hear somebody talking about Bible prophecy you kind of almost taught by church that that's weird, that that's something that only kind of weird fringe people or groups get into. And what Mr. Flurry really brings out in this article is how much Jesus Christ talked about, pro like this is the heart and core of the Bible. I mean, he, he says in there now, prophecy was a big part of Christ's message. Yet most preachers today make it very clear that they are not into prophecy and don't want to speak about it. And he talks about Matthew 24, which uh, he called his greatest prophecy on the Mount of Olives, where he was talking about the end of the world and all of these kind of phrases that we associate, we can associate with being a bit weird. Uh, but Jesus Christ himself talked a lot about prophecy. And I think that is, um, that is something that you don't get from the world. And Mr. Ferry really, really brought that out. I think it's been something I've been thinking about even more just this summer and you know i teach an international relations class at, at herbert w armstrong college we had a conversation in class the other day where we were talking about kind of the value of world news and the value of bible prophecy and i was talking about well what what can you how can you benefit from this and the students i think made good points but one thing i think that was kind of noticeably missing from a lot of their answers was very practical, tangible benefits within their spiritual life and their own relationship with God that they can get from Bible prophecy. Uh, and I think these are people that are open to, you know, these are students, they've come to college, uh, that they're definitely very much open to this. But I think even for them, and I think you know, I talk about this every day or you know, very often, and I think even for myself, it's easy to underestimate just the, for your own personal growth, for my own personal growth, we need Bible prophecy as part of our diet. Uh, and I think that's one of the takeaways from this article. There've been other articles and messages we've heard over the summer that I think have really just made that um, very tangible. Uh, so this is something that we need, that this is something that orientates our, our thinking towards the future and helps lift us out of the mundane of everyday life. It helps cement the power and relevance of God's word. And that's going to make us give it more value, be more attentive to it, change our lives in in accordance with its instructions. Uh, like there's, there is just a real power in, in Bible prophecy. And, and this article really gets that across. Right. Jesus Christ was a prophet. And he makes that point. You just made that point. And if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to square that you've got you you can't skip that you can't move past that you know i'm not a news junkie i'm not really into you know i'm not into infotainment <laughs> i'm i'm uh you know i'm just i just want to live like you know jesus wanted me to live well over and over he talks about prophecy and he and he tells his disciples his students christians uh many things about prophecy and he obligates them as this title says prophesy or become god's enemy he obligates them to to do something with it uh, to know it for sure um and to use it in their lives like like you're saying to have that perspective because that's a 
that's the perspective of Jesus Christ. That's the perspective of God, his father, is humanity, right? It is the people in the boats and the people in the war zones. And, the you know, God's perspective is on them and he commands people who follow him and follow Jesus Christ to care about that. And to do something about that, and and uh, to and it, you can become God's enemy. It says, Mister Fuller says here, without you know going outside and shaking your fist at the sky and saying, "I hate you, God." <laughs> you can become God's enemy, or, or like Mister Fuller says here, like people could say they were following Christ, and that was one of his prophecies that people would say that they were following Christ, and and be his enemy because you're not doing what he said. And so I, th I think it's almost, I mean, first of all, it's unquestionable that there's a spirit world, there's good and evil. Uh, the Bible is unlike, unlike any other uh, book. And like it says right here on page one in this issue, uh, it's quoting Jesus. And he said, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So if you believe him, you would believe that in this end time that he's referring to, these latter days that he's referring to, there will be deceptions, people saying that Jesus was the Christ, but not teaching what he said, not, and that includes Bible prophecy. So if you're, you know, you need to square that. Jesus was a prophet. If I'm following him, then I've got to get out of my own way of thinking and, and, and follow that to the point that becoming God's enemy is at risk like you know like i say if you 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 can say you can become god's enemy without saying i hate you god or i i'm an atheist now or you can think you're a christian you can be deceived and you can actually be god's enemy as mr flurry says in this this page one from the editor and there's a couple of different i guess levels of that deception uh, you've got a world that is cut off from god and you've got deceived Christian churches like you like you articulated and then also in that article he's talking to really people that were a part of God's church that were behind a message a powerful message of prophecy that went out to the world under Herbert W. Armstrong and then a message that was stopped and so many went along with it or just didn't really do it. for whatever they stopped getting behind a prophetic message and in that article, Mr. Flurry said, God commands those he calls into his church before Christ's second coming to publish his message and prophesy for him. And there's a sobering warning there. Mr. Flurry also says he's going to give us a reward so wonderful it shatters the imagination if we will work hard to let this world know what is coming and give them the opportunity to repent. God wants to save people from the suffering that is coming. So there's a message that that really has to go out and there's there's too many people that were giving a prophetic message that are now maybe happy to sit back and receive a prophetic message but they're no longer no longer getting it out and in this context there's just one more quote i wanted to read from this from this article that is just so relevant i think to this to this program uh, where Mr. Flurry quotes Amos 3 in verse 8 that says the lion has roared who will not fear the lord god has spoken who can but prophesy and Mr. Flurry says, God has spoken. How can you sit back and not prophesy? This is a matter of life and death. The eternal God has spoken to try and warn people of the coming troubles. Who can but prophesy? All these prophecies are being fulfilled right before our eyes. God wants us to prophesy and tell this world what it all means and where it is leading. That is why we prophesy. That is why this magazine you are reading exists. I mean, that's why the show is here. Uh, he says, going on with the quote, God has spoken we are, and we are compelled to share the understanding of his prophecies with a world that desperately needs them. That perspective changes how you read the Bible. There's these huge sections of the Bible that you just skip or you just, you just, you know, read it and it sounds confusing. It sounds weird even, uh, some of those things. And then you, you, you look at this and you're like, all right, stop trying to fit god and the bible and jesus into my perspective on god the bible and jesus and change my perspective to what the bible says then then you know things kind of get taken out of your hands and you and you and you uh you you have to adapt to what the bible actually says but in doing that 
a lot of it becomes a lot more clear. And I'm not saying like every single line, you know, there's many things and many prophetic things that, you know, you, I don't understand if you turn to the middle of Isaiah or Ezekiel or something. Uh, but so much of it does come right into focus. And 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 you you understand God, you understand Christ, who was a prophet, uh, differently, and and that changes your perspective. And and to your point earlier about the, there's people who 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 believe they're Christian, um, and and don't understand prophecy, go to a Sunday church and and don't hear that ever ever even mentioned. Um, and then there's uh, there are many who who were in. A one true church, which is what Christ said, there'd be one small church among the many deceived. Um, but he said, um, but they, but many have come in and then and then left that message, left that responsibility of of prophesying. Um, what's really interesting that I don't think you can get past is the message continues even after the man died. So you, you mentioned Herbert W. Armstrong College. Herbert W. Armstrong was the one who, who founded the Plain Truth, uh, the World Tomorrow program, and, and reached many, many, many people. Uh, he died uh, after a long life, a long ministry, and then, and then did everything, did, did, was that message of prophecy and everything else that's, that's included in, in that message of the Bible that gospel message, that warning message, did that die? Did that turn out to just be powered by Herbert W. Armstrong, the man? And 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 well, now that he died, well, we, you know, it all fell apart and it really wasn't valuable to begin with. Or is that exact same message and more, you know, built on, upon it still in existence? And 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 why would that be? And is it right after all, you know, and, and so Mr. Flurry does, as you're kind of saying, he takes the kind of extraordinary step of just um, not extraordinary, but uh, the extra step of, of reaching out uh, to, to those people in particular and say that message is still here. Those prophecies are still here. World events are what they are at this point. So again, you, you, to be honest with yourself, you've got to square that. You've got to deal with that. Uh, before you before you move on. And I think the other point, another point in that article that, that really stood out to me was Mr. Ferry talked about how much humanly we don't like prophecy. Like there is an inbuilt human nature resistance to prophecy. He said, this is the way human beings like it. They don't want truth. They would rather hear deceits than the true prophecy of God. This is what human nature wants. They don't want God's way of life. They want lawlessness. And that's the you know, prophecy is all about cause and effect. And it's all about this is the end result of lawlessness. Like there are laws, you obey God's laws, you get blessings. You disobey God's laws, you receive cursings. And human nature wants to disobey the laws, do whatever we want, and have blessings and have good things. And, and like prophecy is completely antithetical to that. Like it, 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 it warns, it corrects, it says the way you're going is wrong and it won't work and cannot work. And there is an inbuilt resistance to that because we don't want to be, we want to justify the way that we want to go and say, well, this way is the right way to go anyway. Uh, and so the, I thought he just powerfully articulated in the section there are just, that's another reason why prophecy kind of, we have this society and this conception of the Bible where prophecy feels weird or seems weird because human nature doesn't want to hear it. That's, 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 the crux of it right there is that that you people think that Christian living and the teachings of Christ and you shall not lie and teach your children to to give and such and such nation shall fall <laughs> the prophecy are two different things and and that they're not really related and that you can sort of categorize one here you know I'm not into prophecy I don't uh, I'm not, I don't know world events. It's all kind of overwhelming and it, it is. Um, and so I just want to focus on my family and, and going to church and, you know, well, th those things are not disconnected. Those things are not separate from one another. And, and that's what Mr. Floyd, you know, draws our attention to in this from the editor 
is is they're they're part of the same thing. And what you're seeing at national is what you're seeing at national scale is the result of moral choices and and not just moral choices but as you said there's a law there's a law of cause and effect from the creator of the earth and of human beings the laws that cause happiness and and breaking the laws causes unhappiness you you you're seeing that at scale when you're talking about the nations of israel today um and and these these prophecies so they're 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 not separate things and when you understand that the picture of the bible becomes a lot broader a lot clearer and and i think it's just something that people have to have they have to have that perspective that's in this article and i'd like to bring a second article from mr flurry into this discussion because i think it, it fits right in here and that is is his article nuclear proliferation will humanity to will humanity survive which opens with this stunning statistic that this world spends $2,900 on nuclear weapons every second. And that spending on nuclear weapons has increased 10% in the last year. Generations that grew up in the Cold War seem to spend a lot more time worrying and thinking about nuclear war. These days, we, we, we don't. I don't think our generation does. Uh, but then... We're spending, you know, nuclear weapon spending is skyrocketing. We have, every time we're talking about Ukraine on the Weekend Review, there's always, is Russia going to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine is a big part of the discussion. Uh, and so here we have an article that talks about the ultimate consequences of, of human action, that talks about something that I think on the surface can seem very depressing. I think that's part of the reason why our generation doesn't think much about nuclear weapons. Like, it's much more, we'd rather just pretend that there's no issue here and that we've not had nuclear war for 70, 80 years. So problem solved, we hope. Let's move on and not think about it that much. Um, but it also contains the only real, true, substantial hope. Uh, and that's, that's not just kind of wishful thinking that addresses the problem head on, but then also shows from the Bible why we're not going to end in nuclear conflict. Well, and this is one of the things that Herbert W. Armstrong talked about in in the Plain Truth, and 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 repeatedly warned about, uh, not only when it was the issue of the day, not only when it was uh, in the headlines of other news, news organizations, and it's something that that we're talking about, even though there's not a recent headline about um, about a nuclear war. In one sense, in one sense, every single day you're wondering if Vladimir Putin will will use that tactical nuke uh in 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 battle um but it's a ish it's an issue and it's in the trumpet because of the prophecy right because of the of the conclusion and we're working backward from there uh as we as we're talking about with the immigration issue um but this is another good example of what you're talking about where where this is not separate from from your life because in 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 life, anyone knows that that you human nature, our nature that we've that we've um, inherited from, you know, we're created by God, but we clearly have a non God influence <laughs> on us, uh, and that's so deeply ingrained that Mr. Armstrong said it's like human human nature, for lack of a better term, it's so deep in us that we will keep doing it wrong, keep doing what we want to do, even when we know it's going to cause cancer, it's going to, cause, you know, we're going to uh, be into alcoholism, we're, you know, we'll just keep going into the self-destructive uh, uh, habits or, or self-destructive decisions with our families or, you know, whatever it is. It's the same thing at scale. It's the same thing, Mr. Armstrong said, uh, nations or families grown large. It's a family, then you know, clan, tribe, nation. This is human nature at scale. We are going to go so, the, the Bible says, if you're going to believe Jesus Christ, then you've got to believe that we're going to get so bad. We're going to be, we're going to put our own will. I'm teaching my kids, understand that that's your will. You know, you're putting your own will ahead of reality itself. It's going to get so bad. We're going to smash into nuclear 
war or nuclear terrorism. There's going to be mass destruction. And, and the Bible says we're even still people are going to be like, no, I want what I want. <laughs> you know, I want to do it my way. I'm going to, you know, I am going to, you know, people will be the enemy of God. They will curse God's name. And but the, the, again, the, the point being that our human nature is is not inherently good. And it's it's so self-willed that things will literally, literally go nuclear. We just talked about those 12 people dying. Uh, I believe it was a dozen people dying. Well, there's going to be many, many deaths. And and we'll we'll still we'll still resist. We'll still have that human nature. This is how bad it will get and how and the scale at which it, it'll get. And it really is. It's an article about repentance as much as it is about nuclear war. Right. Uh, right. And Mr. Flurry makes this, like he quotes where there is a message that some people put are putting out about, well, Jesus Christ is going to, to save us from this. And mm -hmm. they're right. He is. But he points out that in this message, they, they were quoting uh, from Second Chronicles 7, and they were quoting about, well, God's going to save us. But they edited out from that, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. Like they, they edited out and turn from their wicked ways and forgive their sins. Like they edited out the bit about repentance. And that is right. crucial. Yeah, we are having this message that goes out and it's a message of hope and it's a message of reassurance. Yeah, the world is not going to end in nuclear fire. All of these negative stories that you see um, all around you, they're not the end. There is a solution. But part of a, a vital part of that message is also, well, there has to be repentance. All of these are leading to repentance. Once that repentance comes, well, then, yes, then we've changed. We're living a different way of life. We can address the cause of all of these problems. But things will keep getting worse until there is repentance. And this article, the latter half especially, focuses on how repentance is the core of hope for nations and individuals. I mean, he concludes with the example of Nineveh, with the example of Assyria. Modern day, which is now modern day Germany. There's a massive, they're the only nation in history that repented when warned by a prophet. And they turned it around and the nation was saved. And that's a that's recorded in the Bible as a beautiful message to us today. And he concludes the article saying, you cannot reach your wonderful human potential without first acknowledging your wicked ways, turning from them, being forgiven of your sins, and then with God's help, keeping God's wonderful law. But if you will do that, that is the only the, only the beginning of your incredible future. And so really it's in repentance that mankind's true hope lies. And you know, repentance is towards God. It's only possible because of God. So it, it, it's not a, a hope that's in man, but it's a, it's, a, it, it's a hope of repentance that is, that's where our future is. And that, that does lead, I think, into that final article from Mr. Flurry. And it's one, I think we've already, it peppers what we've already talked about on on this show it is the spiritual reality behind even the immigration what we've what we've talked about earlier the mystery of the spirit realm where you know, i think what we've talked about already raises a lot of questions like okay if there's a spirit world if there's a devil you know where 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 does the devil come from why does god allow a devil are there devils plural are there demons what about angels how does that fit in these are all answers that are revealed in the Bible, and there's a lot of false beliefs out there that uh, incorporate bits of man's tradition and mix that in with some biblical truth. Uh, but the the final article from Mr. Flurry, um, well, he, it begins, the truth about angels and evil spirits mystifies most people, but you can understand. It gives those Bible-based answers to this question. Right. And, and like you said, we've already kind of talked about this and how these things are not separate. They're not silos. They're not different categories of life. Like we are, we were created by this God who prophesies, who, who uh, gives laws to be obeyed and, uh, and, and has our, our best interest at heart to, to understate it significantly. Um, and, and, and so this, th there is a moral dimension to immigration there is a, a moral lesson to be learned from nuclear pro proliferation. There, there is, um, there is a moral dimension to all of these things, 
and I think even that sometimes may, maybe we're kind of um, when we say moral, um, it's as if there's this thing that's that's morality that doesn't exist at the hands as the result of the of the laws of the creator. <laughs> that's what when we say morals, that's what we mean. What's right by the creator of human beings who knows everything about human beings and who has the love to tell us what those things are. We're just so self-willed that we rebel against it. Uh, just another way of saying that we rebel, uh, the human nature rebels against God's law. Um, but this mystery of the spirit realm acknowledges the obvious. There's definitely something that's not molecules going on. There's definitely something evil and, and there's something sad about what happened to those people in that boat that capsized. That is not explained by molecules and energy and atoms, right? Like if people, if there's, we still got this in our heads, this, this evolutionary concept that, that uh, morals must be something we invented and it's really just molecules bouncing off each other. There's a spirit world for sure. There's a spirit realm. There's a non-physical component to human beings and their interactions and so this takes you into the bible and says well what does the bible say about that and do you do you see that is that is that the reality that that uh that you see around you and you've, you've got to account for good and evil from somewhere They're not morals or mores or you know it's it's the laws of cause and effect um and they're non-physical so this this article and and also the 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 titles that he cites in here United States and Britain and Prophecy Malachi's message raising the ruins really open your mind to again not just the existence of a spirit world but how specific uh God is in his interventions and his laws and and how specific uh the the devil is in his interventions and in and, and his um, actions that, that influence the world and that influence each of us individually. Well, I think that's a great, great way to conclude the show. Thank you so much for joining us today, Philip. My pleasure. And um, that was, we've been discussing the latest, the October issue of the Trumpet magazine. You can get your own free print copy as well. I'd really like to encourage you to do that. You can sign up on our website, uh, thetrumpet.com. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. We will send you that free print copy. There's no postage costs. There's, there's none of these. There's none of these other costs associated with it. It's just absolutely free. There's no follow up. We're not going to badger you for anything. It's just at the end of the end of the year. We will ask you if you want to keep receiving that, uh, and you can get and you can study that. that. That's the bulk of the article. There's even more in there. There's uh, an article about the beatification of the border tsar. Uh, we've got some article on biblical archaeology, the Tel Dan Steeler. There's an article on uh, Egypt and the potential for unrest in that country. Article on Vladimir Putin. Uh, article on hard work. There's usually some pieces on Christian living in there as well. We would be very happy to send that to you and you can get that on our website thetrumpet.com you can also email us if you have any comments any questions if you have any trouble ordering a subscription you can get in touch with us at trumpetworld at thetrumpet.com you can also get that in other languages as well if you look at the language tab at the top of the website we do have a french edition a german edition it may not have all of the same articles but I th the the big the main ones will be in there you'll just have to wait a little bit longer for us to get that translated and uh we will keep talking about those articles. I really, really enjoyed uh, this conversation. Philip, we'll have to do this again when we have the uh, November, December issue out. F and we will be back on Friday with our regular panel here on YouTube or Rumble or, or over the air on KPCG. No matter how you listen to us, we're very grateful to have you. We'll see you on Friday. Until then, keep watching your world. Mm -hmm.